welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. This is episode 17. I'm Andrew. And I'm Andrea. So we hope to bring you a very uplifting and inspiring episode today because there's a lot of people who are not feeling so well, not so good, because of the current political climate. Um, and we want to bring you a little bit of extra joy in your life. Yep. So this is a podcast about knitting. Um, we've got a lot on the show today. We do. We've got a fantastic interview with Marie Wallen, who was the head designer of Rowan, the Rowan magazine, and she was is one of my favourite designers. So I was so excited to first to be able to interview her and now to be able to share it with you. So that's that's coming up. That's going to be in two parts because it's a little bit longer than normal. So we'll start off pretty soon with the first part, and the second part will be at the end of the the episode. Yeah. And our guest today on Knitters of the World is Uta Rehner. Um, you may tell from the name, Uta is German. She lives in Sindelfingen, which is near Stuttgart, um, a couple of hundred kilometres south of us. It's, we sort of head down that direction sometimes when we're going for a hike in the woods. Um, Uta is also a, a very keen and accomplished knitter. She's got a blog in, uh, in German. Um, she's also a very big fan of Marie Wallen. I know I did have yeah. a read of the blog, so yeah. it's worth seeing uh, Uta's work and having a listen to what she yeah. has to say. And we're also featuring from the archives, and I'm going to talk in quite a lot of detail about the um, sort of the cardigan jacket that I'm wearing, which was the, the first Alice Darmore project that I did using her wool. And I learned so much about it. There's a lot of complicated techniques used in it that I'd never done before. So I want to share that with you. So looking forward to doing that. And we're also going to be announcing the winners of our two carls. So that's yeah. the first garment, first garment carl, which was Andrew's carl. That's right. And which he's still knitting on. I'm still working my first garment. <laughs> And the Fair Isle Garment, Carl. So the winners have been drawn and we're going to tell you very soon. Yeah, and there's a little surprise there. Oh, there is. There's a very special surprise there. Yep. But let's start off now directly with under construction. I've been working on my blossoms and this is a quick uh, picture of the design. This is by Marie Wallen. It does seem that every second design that I'm knitting is a Marie Wallen design and... Every, every other design that I'm knitting is an Alice Darmore one. So that does tell you something about my personal aesthetic. Yeah. <laughs> Which I think you could probably describe as complex colour work, lots of texture, quite ornate, but a very traditional sort of Englishy look. Perhaps that, that I think that's fair it. enough. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Anyway, this jumper... I showed you a little bit more detail last week. I had done the sleeve, so it's knitted from the bottom up in the round. Um, it has intarsia rosebud motifs on the hem and the cuffs of the sleeves here. Then I knitted the sleeves bottom up, two at a time magic loop. And then they join onto the body ready to do the yoke. And so as you see, I've done about five centimeters of Fair Isle, and then after that, I have um, very big major rose intarsia um, designs to knit about five of them. Yeah, one, two, three, and two on the back. Five. Yeah. So it's very similar to what you did around the. the well, these are just the little rose. rose buds. These are going to be complete Bigger. beautiful blossoms. That's okay. and the and the design is called Blossoms by Marie Wallen, and it's knitted in the Rowan felted tweed. What I do like about this design here is that after you join the, the sleeves together with the body, you have about five centimeters of decrease in sort of like a, a raglan style here. I may put another picture over Andrew. <laughs> but that makes it fit. I just don't want my stitches to fall off, but that makes it fit a lot better under the arms. Um, oh got hay fever at the moment <laughs> I keep wanting to sneeze it fits it, it gives it more of a set in sleevey feel I think so I'm really happy that that's like that I still maintain that it's not that difficult a design to do I'm gonna to have to get myself a tissue <laughs> excuse me I was talking to a pilot once and he said that flying an aeroplane was hours of of boredom 
interspersed with moments of terror. And that kind of reminds me a little bit in a positive way <laughs> of a jumper like this because you've got hours of relaxing knitting to do. So all of this stocking stitch here and on the arms with small parts of um, deep concentration, which is just the intarsia. This ferrule part here is very easy ferrule. You don't have long strands. It's very easy pattern to memorize. And then you've got more concentration on the blossoms above. Who's this? pilot? <laughs> the pilot I spoke to. Yeah. It was just on one trip when I took a small uh, flight to my mum's house in Australia on one of the tiny little oh, planes. Really? Yeah, and I got this... to sit in the in the cabin. I gotta say oh really? Yeah. I gotta say that's probably one of my dream jobs, this little flight. What is it? It's yeah. about from from Adelaide to Port something. Lincoln. Yeah. Across just the peninsula. Across across the sea, by the coast oh, in beautiful. southern Australia. It is absolutely divine. And just to have a job to be paid to just fly backwards yeah. and forwards, I reckon it's pretty yeah. This tiny little aeroplane where they actually tell you, I've done this trip, and um, they actually tell you exactly where to sit. They look at you and figure out how much you weigh, and they say, all right, we need you, sit, you to sit there. That's how small <laughs> it all is. So. And it rattled, the plane rattles so much. It really just feels yep. like you're in a, yep. a canvas right. contraption. So that's me finished, and on to you, Andrew. Yep. So I'm still working on my hiking jacket. I'm not eligible for the first garment, Cal, because my jacket is not finished. This is the, um, what is it, the right front? Yeah, it's got right? it inside out. Oh, it's inside out. Well, it's all curled up anyway. You can't really see it. If you want to see it, go back and watch the other episodes. It's not a lot <laughs> different to them. Um, I actually, I have to say, we can put our, our what's your excuse? This what your excuse was created for me. Um, <laughs> I have to say, I'm doing some study right now. I've been doing it all year, but it's at a kind of intense phase. So the general routine is that I go to work during the day and then I come home and do adulting. I don't really like that word stuff around the house <laughs> and then do some study and if I get to sit down and relax it's going to be about 10 30 and then I'm brain dead and might get a couple of rows out and then he goes to bed and yeah. then I go to bed so you're doing um, exceptionally well I'm doing exceptionally well the you've you've done a bit of intarsia I've got a bit of intarsia that's the one challenge that I face here is just getting the intarsia sort of I'm just doing one color to another it's not really a big deal but still getting the tension on that right I well, have to just pay a bit the, of the the crossover because yep. he um, it's all right, everything's fine, everything's good. So what's nice here is to have it very very smooth connected and no sloppy stitches at the join. Yeah, we don't want it sloppy. And that's sometimes we do have to go back and fix that up, but yes. that's really important, and and that's going to look good. I'm actually designing this on the go, which is really not the right thing to do at all. I, I mean, I know how it's going to be, but I don't want you to knit too much before I figure out how, when we've got to start decreasing for that. Yeah. For this. I thought I was just going to... So that's, or, or I'm it. trying to avoid it so that Andrew doesn't have to unpick anything since yep. he so rarely gets to knit. Yeah, but look, this is a major project. I'm okay with it taking a bit of time. I'm just going to insert here uh, just a couple of pictures of Andrew wearing his Firebirds jumper. Uh, we got out on the weekend when it wasn't raining and took some photos and... It fits him really well, as you can see in the photos. Yep. And he's happily wearing it. So uh, somebody has to eat their hat, do they? Or do they? What was the deal? I don't know. Someone said that if oh. they would like to see you wearing it, one of our viewers. Yeah, there was a comment. Or, in there. or they think I'm a genius if he does it. That's so maybe right. I'm a genius. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you for that. You're a genius. <laughs> I'm not sure how we get to use that. <laughs> It's better me being a genius than you having to eat your hat. Yep. <laughs> I think it was one of our regular viewers who said that, yep. made that comment. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Because I originally designed the Firebirds. No, you didn't, well, Dom. I did design them. <laughs> Jade, Jade Starmore designed the Firebirds. But I adapted it into a gentleman's jumper and it was very originally knitted as a little girl's cardigan. Yeah. So it's been sort of a joke. Okay, so we're actually now on to the first part of the Marie Wallen interview. I have to just excuse myself because I have suddenly a burst of full-on hay fever and my nose won't stop itching, so please excuse me. So Marie Wallen is, um, as you've heard me talk about her on so many episodes, one of my favourite designers. She's an incredibly experienced designer. She's worked for many years in the commercial designing knitwear industry. She's also a lecturer at various um, uh, reputable design 
colleges and, and universities. And um, so she's got a wealth of experience. So, And when she was at Rowan, she designed herself, but she also oversaw the whole collection that went into the magazine and the editing of the magazine. And the magazine constantly features other great designers like um, Kay Fassett and Martin Story. So she's had she's got to work with these wonderful people as well. So she really has a lot to say and she's got a lot to say for just hobby knitters like me and most of you, but also for aspiring designers and designers of all levels. So I think this is this is great. The first part of the interview, she's going to mainly just talk about the the key things that she learnt throughout her career, from early in the college years studying and um, then later working at Rowan. And in the second part of the interview, which we'll put in at the end of the episode, she shows us in detail how her design process works. And she even shows us her sketches and swatches. And so you get a really good idea how all of this comes together behind the scenes. So enjoy it. Welcome to the Fruity Knitting Podcast. As many of you already know, I'm a huge fan of Marie Wallen's designs, so you can imagine how excited and honoured I feel to be able to introduce her to you today. But before I do, I'm going to give you a quick summary of her background. Marie completed a first class honours degree in knitwear design in the mid 80s. She then had her own knitwear design label before returning to the commercial design where many of her designs became part of best selling collections for British high street retailers. And then in 2005, Marie joined Rowan as the head designer. And in this role, she both designed and oversaw the design collections for the publications, as well as directing the art and styling of most of the photography shoots, which we all know were extremely beautiful. So Marie was also responsible for the editorial content of Rowan magazine and heavily involved with the development of new yarn ranges and seasonal colorways. So after 11 years as head designer of Rowan, Marie now has her own design company where she produces her own books and kits and holds popular creative workshops and has a very popular fair isle club. So thank you, Marie, for your time today. I could totally squeal with delight that you've agreed <laughs> to be on the podcast. <laughs> so a very warm welcome to you and from the Fruity Knitting Podcast. Hello. Hello, everyone. <laughs> I've given a quick outline of your career path. Could you just fill in with a few more details with an emphasis on the parts that you found most helpful for learning your craft? Okay, well, um, I learned to knit very young at the age of six and I obviously knitted a little bit when I was a child. But really, um, it was when I went to college, I learned more about knitwear design. Um, but it was all on hand flap machines and power machines that I, I learned about knit stitches rather than hand knitting. In fact, I did very little hand knitting at, at college. Um, and really it was the hand flat side of things that really helped me when I started to do a lot more hand knitting. I think if you're um, if you know how a stitch is formed on a machine then it's actually easier to actually work it out how it's done on 
by hand. So um, it's something I always say to my students as I do a bit of teaching at Nottingham Trent University that, um, you know, whatever you can do on the power machines, you can do um, by hand and actually do a little bit more because you can change it as you go along a lot more easily by hand than you can on, on, a, on a hand flat machine. Um, so so that that aspect alone was has, has helped me a lot as a as a hand knit designer um, and it really wasn't until i actually went for my interview with rowan um which was in in 2005 that i actually had to get my knitting needles out again and and start to hand knit and it was oh many many years um, prior to that before i actually did any any hand, hand knitting so i actually um produced um um, a lot of hand knit swatches for the interview with mood boards and things like that and um, went along to the interview which was a week long believe it or not and um, and then at the end of the week obviously I was thrilled to know that I, I got the job but when I joined Rowan um, the biggest steepest learning curve was actually the art direction and styling and learning about the photography side and the publications of the of the actual books because that's was something I was responsible for and it was something I really hadn't done before um so um so that aspect was was quite hard because there was no one really there to show me it was something i had to learn myself and actually um you know talk to the photographers i've met some brilliant photographers some wonderful people being able to go to the most amazing locations um you know met wonderful other designers like Kay Fassett who I, i've always really admired um, Martin Story, um, you know, people like that and, you know, worked with, you know, the most amazing people. So I am very lucky. I want to now talk about your designing because I, from my point, I feel like you're quite unusual because you have very high level hand knitting skills in all of the major knitting techniques. So fair isle and stranded and cables and lace as well as crochet. And in all of these techniques, you've created fantastic and complicated designs. So my question is, were you first fascinated with the knitting techniques and your designs were a result of playing with those techniques? Or did you first have a visual aesthetic of patterns and colors and textures that you wanted to create? And then you had to go out and learn the knitting techniques to be able to design them. Um, it's probably more the latter because I'm very much a pattern and colour driven person. So when I design or when I designed in the past when I wasn't quite as experienced as I am now, I would actually um, try, and, uh, try and imagine what the finished design would be. Um, and then actually if I needed to acquire skills to achieve that design, then I would actually go out and 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 get and do it really i mean it's like with the crochet side of it i taught myself to crochet when i was in my 20s um because it was just something i wanted to do at the time and then when i was at rowan um i then obviously um sort of had a lot more did a lot more crochet and wanted to to do a lot more crochet so i taught me taught myself how to do the more complicated stitches um and things like that so as a as a pattern led person and color person the fabric itself is is the most important thing to me um and then the actual garment design comes second to the actual fabric design so i tend to design garment shapes to fit the actual um fabric design it was slightly different at rowan because we had to you know include certain modern shapes and things like that so sometimes fabric designs got into garment shapes um, which weren't, didn't quite necessarily work, um, but now um, I'm doing my own things and um, I'm free to do whatever I want to do, then, you know, I'm very much um, the garment actual shape comes second to the actual fabric design. Can you just describe your typical designing process from your first idea to a finished garment and perhaps while you're doing that include um, what you see your design aesthetic as being and where your strengths lay? Well, it's quite a long process, the design process. I'll, I'll tell you from the point of view of what I do now. Um, really, it all starts off with an idea for a collection of, of what I 
type of thing that I want to do and what and what yarn I want to use or and whose yarn I want to use now which I'm very lucky now to be able to use other people's yarn so um, and not just Rowan so um, so I'm very lucky in, in that aspect and um, so once I've decided what type of collection I want to do so if it's going to be a fur isle collection um, then I would I would actually then do a bit of research, have a look what's new around on, on the, in the trends and everything like that. At Rowan, it was very much more trend driven. Um, you know, we, Rowan was very much a fashion led brand, fashion led brand. So um, we, the starting point for the design brief for Rowan was with, um, with looking at all the trends um, where they use different trend agencies and things. So it wasn't just trend for color, it was trend for fashion as well. Um, but myself, uh, now I actually, well, I still look at uh, the things that are on the catwalk and things, but I also, I, I look at other things as well. So, for example, um, uh, myself and my husband um, had a lovely holiday in Spain this summer and we visited some amazing places. And um, and I've, I've got a lot of inspiration from there, which hopefully you'll see in some of my designs next year. Um, so it's just, it's things like that really. And once, once I've got um the type of ideas i want to do i then do a lot of scribbling on paper um sort of the type of design i want to do and then um that then goes on to graph paper um and gets put down a little bit more formally um i have a, a massive big set of colored pencils which virtually match every color you can imagine so i i look at the the colors i want to use and i match up um a color pencil with those and then I have I color in the with, with the fur I'll with that once I'm happy with that then I actually knit this uh, a, a swatch of that particular fur i so and I would say about 50 60 percent of the time I'm not totally happy with the design swatch that I've done um, and rather than starting again and redoing it um, I look at the swatch and decide which colors are slightly unbalanced and things so I would then switch on another colour on top of, of something else or add another colour in, take a colour out by swiss darning an existing colour over the top um, until I'm happy with that swatch. And once I'm happy with that swatch, then that actually then I input that into, into um, Illustrator on my computer and then that gets printed off as an actual chart and that information um, together with a very detailed garment spec um, will then go to my pattern writer. Um, I I can pattern write, um, but it's a job I don't particularly enjoy. <laughs> um, so and plus I don't have the time, you know, to do it. Yeah. So um, I actually use a really good pattern writer who um, actually writes patterns for Rowan as well. So um, I'm quite lucky in that in that point of view. Um, and really, once once I've once I'm happy with the swatch and everything, then I really decide the type of garment I want that to go into. Um, so it could be a fitted fitted sweater, could be knitted in the round, could be a cardigan that's steeped maybe. Um, although I haven't done that many of those um, up till now, um, and or it could be an oversized um, jumper or, or a cardigan. Okay. Um, so as a, so as I said, it's the fabric that's the most important thing to me rather than the actual garment shape. So just getting back onto um, construction, a lot of your Fair Isle patterns are written in the flat, which means that knitters have to be fairly comfortable purling in Fair Isle. Yeah. Um, so is there a particular reason why these, why these designs were constructed? So are there advantages and... and well, the, one of the main reasons for fur isling flat was that most people in the UK prefer to fur isle flat. Um, that was, um, it's something that we've, we, I, from our rowing days, basically, that's something we all, always did. Although now I would have said more and more UK people want to actually um, learn to steek. Um, as more and more people wanted to learn fur isle, and obviously it's easier to learn fur isle when it's knitted in the round. And therefore, if they want to continue to knit in the round, then you need to learn how to steek. So it's trying to sort of teach people and give them the confidence to be able to do that. But I do say when I, because I hold many fair hour workshops and it's trying to 
um, tell people that it's all very well and good just fur isle in, in the round, but if you actually learn to fur isle flat and fur isle on the wrong side, then you know you'll be able to fur isle anything. It's it's you know it's very versatile, and you'll be able to fur isle into any shape. Um, a few of my for our designs in in the past have like got shapes, side seams, and uh, got pockets and wider necks and things like that, which is obviously a lot more difficult to stick if you if you did that. Yeah. So, um, so really from 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 that point, so I do try and encourage people. Although it's fine just to knit in the round, and it's a lot quicker to knit farrell in the round. Um, I do try and encourage people and teach people how to fur on, on the wrong side, really from the point of view is that they, they can do anything yeah. once they've learned how to do that. And do you also find that the seaming helps with structure in the garment? It can do, yes. Yeah, absolutely, it can It can do. And then obviously if you're doing um, cushions and throws and things like that, it helps helps from that point of view as well. So, so let's talk about colour because I totally love the way you use colour in your designs. What are some of the important points that guide your colour choices when designing? And can you give some nuggets of advice to knitters who might want to change a colourway of one of your designs, but still want to keep the original beauty and integrity of the design? Okay. I get asked this question quite a bit, really, about putting colours together. Um, it's something that I'm a big believer you can teach to a certain degree, but it also comes natural to a lot of people as well. I think I'm lucky um, to be able to say it probably does come naturally to me with put, putting colours together. Um, but the main thing what I look for is when I, I look at, at a whole load of colours and what I just what I decide to put together in um, in a pattern, is really you're looking at like tonal values of actual co of colours. So. Um, so, for example, if you had an orange and a blue, uh, which are obviously at the opposite ends of the colour wheel, they don't have to be at the opposite ends, um, you could, they need to be of the same tonal strength. So when you actually look at them together, neither of them are dominant. So um, your eyes are actually not drawn to one uh, rather than the other. They're actually, you know, equally um, the same. So in that way, the actual pattern itself um does is visually is is good on the eye your eyes like to look at it because it's you know it's not it's not harsh in any way so um, just the, to interrupt so you mean by tonal value the same as in one is not uh brighter or darker yes, than the other yeah yeah, so they're both at the same strength of colour, if you like. So it's like an example. So if you if you look at an orange and a blue, sometimes you'll you'll look at an orange and a blue, and the blue is stronger than the orange, or vice versa. What I'm saying is that both both those colour, the both levels of those colours are the same. So when you look at them, your eye your eyes are are just happy at looking at either of them. Yeah. There's not one that's jumping out over the other. Um, so as, lo as long as your colours, um, well that's how I put my, my colours together. Um, and then when you're designing fur hour, one of the um, things you also need to look at is, is introducing a highlight colour. Um, and that you normally you put in at the the least amount. So you look at your design that you've just done and the areas um, that, that are um, sort of um, regular throughout the pattern but only in small little areas those those are the best places to put your a highlight color so it could be two rows every sort of I don't know uh, 10 centimeters something like that but it needs to be balanced throughout out the design otherwise it, that would look odd as well um, and the highlight could be anything it tends to be a brighter color but it can also be a darker color as well it really depends on the other colors that you, you that are within your design um, and then the other thing about fur I don't know if you um, if you can remember what I said earlier about um, when I put when I when I do designing um, and sometimes when I put a swatch to a design together and I knit it I'm not happy with with the swatch that is because um, I tend to sort of look at things and if it's unbalanced sometimes you can put the correct colors together but when you've knitted the actual swatch the design looks unbalanced so it might need another um, another part of the pattern repeating to form a new repeat or it, or it could need another sort of section of the highlight color um, so you've got to try and think that your design 
is is balanced at the end of the day if it's a balanced design then it, it will work um, as far as um, substituting colors if you take a fire design um, and you want to put it into your colors then the best rule I could the best tip I can give people um, to do that is to actually look at the colorway that you're actually trying to substitute so you need to start at looking at, at that first and if you know the colours that are, are within that um, in in that design or the the yarns, is to actually look at those colours, and then look at your colours that you want to use, and then do a like for like substitution. So um, if you've got a soft pink um, within the with the original colourway, then you need to replace it with a colour that's equally as soft as that pink. So it could be a soft brown, for example, or a soft orange. So again, yeah. it's the tonal value. If you need to replace it with a colour that really look when you look at them together, they don't neither of them shout. So that goes for for any of the colours that you want to replace. And if you follow those rules, it should, in theory, work okay. Because I would describe your use of colour as being very harmonious, very elegant. Yeah. Well, even that's though be, yeah that's because i use tonal colors really yeah so yeah. even though you could use many many different shades it just yeah. has this beautiful harmonious feeling about yeah. it yeah yeah yeah, yeah. hope you enjoyed that part of the interview and the second part is coming up at the end of the episode so now I want to announce to any new viewers and remind uh, our faithful viewers that we have a really exciting online web event coming up this coming Friday the November the 18th and that's going to be a 50 minute online event with the designer Jorge Locatelli so our Shetland patrons are going to get to hang out personally with Hohi, ask her questions about her designs or knitting in general or just chat away, yeah. however that goes. But this is very, very special because Hohi is a great designer. She's teaching at Vogue Live Knitting, Vogue Knitting Live in January and already all her classes are booked out. So we think this is an extremely valuable opportunity and we would like to encourage people to partake in it. So if perchance you don't know Horhi, we did a interview with her in episode 15 and that's really worth going back and looking at. She's an Argentinian designer and she talks a lot about the Argentinian culture, her transition from being a doctor into a knitwear designer, which is extremely interesting. And she's a very thoughtful and intelligent designer. And on top of that, she's a really caring and lovely person. And I think these characteristics altogether make her very popular. She has a huge following. I think it's going to be a really fun event. It's very small. We've only got a, a small number of people who will be attending at this stage. So if you do decide to get into that, it's going to be a nice intimate group. Yeah. Um, we are going to have video on, on Hui and maybe we'll put video on guests or ourselves. We're not absolutely sure about that and how we'll do it but um Jorge will be there for us to see and we'll be able to show her work and yeah, yeah. like we said any questions or whatever so it's yeah it should be a lot, a lot of fun and yeah it's a big chance and um also i want to say we started two new carls last episode we told you about them one of them is a cabled garment carl and if you would like to join in that carl and you haven't yet got yet got a design and you're looking for one, Jorge is actually a good place to start because she's designed a ton of cabled garments and they really vary from um, advanced knitters to beginner or um, less experienced or maybe perhaps a more tin timid knitter. So she has very simple cables, simple constructions to complex cables in fingering weight constructions. Um, so she's a really good designer to start having a look through her patterns. And if you're interested in, in this web event or just learning more about it, head over to our patron page and check it out. Yeah, we would like to thank the viewers who have become patrons. Um, we are depending, we launched a Patreon campaign about a month ago now, and we've had a good response to that. We 
do have to make it clear that we're depending on getting some financial support to keep producing the podcast. It is a lot of work. It's particularly Andrea who has to put in the work into preparing the uh, interviews, contacting guests or looking up potential guests, doing some research, contacting them, organizing a time to speak, that sort of thing. And it is a lot of work. It takes a lot of time. And really, the only way that we can man- make that manageable for us as a family all together is if Andrea cuts down a little bit of her, um, or at least a, a lot, bit, <laughs> at least a little bit, yep, yeah, of her normal work, which is as a music teacher. Yeah. Okay. Um, at the moment, I'm working on weekends and evenings as well, and it's not really sustainable. Yeah. But we're really keen to keep doing this, but it just takes a lot of time to have all the content. We try to have it a content rich program. Yeah. Yeah. So a big thank you to people who have done that. Yes. Some we people are, have been very generous and thank you very much. That's yeah. great. So Andrea's mentioned the, the live events that we've got on. They're going to continue. This is the first one, which is really exciting, but that's going to be a regular um, uh, event that we're going to put on as, as a reward for our patrons. So we encourage you to go off to patreon.com slash fruity knitting. Check that out. Um, there's lots of information there. We think it's a really good system. And if you, if that doesn't work for you, that's all right. Keep watching. Yes. We are keeping everything free and open. That's something we want to do. Yes. Even the tutorials that I've put out and I've just put out a cabled scarf, um, which teaches you how to knit with a cabled needle and knit without a cabled needle. I go into a lot of detail, all of those kinds of things. I want to keep free for everybody to be able to to look at. But we did want to say something about the ads, didn't we? Yeah. We just wanted to mention one thing. When we launched the Patreon campaign, we did say we'd looked at different options for um, getting some sort of financial support from the podcast and for the podcast, and we had decided against putting the YouTube ads on. Um, We noticed in the last week or so (laughs) that there are YouTube ads showing up on the the program. Um, We looked into this, and the, the reason for this is that the music that we use is copyright. We're allowed to use it the way we do. We're not breaking any copyright rules there at all. Um, but the license holder of the music is allowed to put ads on to any videos that use the music and to get the revenue from that ad. But it's Um, supporting musicians. So I don't, I don't mind in general. And the music is a big part of my life and I think it's a big part of our, of our podcast. And so I don't really want to take it off. So I hope you're all okay with that as well. Yep. Yep. So it wasn't exactly what we planned, but I think it's good. Yeah. Hello, dear knitters. I'm Ute Rena and I'm an amateur knitter. Actually, I love all handwork and crafts. I've been doing it since my childhood and never gave up. Basic instructions in knitting and sewing I got from my grandmother and in elementary school. But I really learned a technique through the description in the magazines that we bought regularly. I never had the original yarn at that time. We bought as cheap as possible. Discontinued or second choice and I adapted the instruction. This was never a problem for me because I always was a good mathematician. Today I'm still working on patterns. I love watching the creative magazines or online databases like Ravelry. I select a design, then buy the yarn and then work on it. Always in this sequence. To have the original material material is for me a poor luxury and relaxation after a long working day. Sometimes I change the or modify the original design a little bit, but design is not my goal. What drives me is to make a garment or home uh, decoration really useful, individual and beautiful. I want to use good and environmentally friendly materials and I want to master the technique well. It is a fantastic new dimension that knitters from all over the world exchange experience and skills through social networks, thus preserving and developing traditions. Mostly I knit for my daughter. 
but the rest of the family never bought gloves or scarves. Currently, I am busy with two projects. One is the very elegant waterfall cardigan by Jenny Atkinson. Look at this wonderful uh, etching with the crystals, front etching with the crystals. And the second is the super cozy hoodie by Sarah Hatton. I'm making it for the girlfriend of my son and I'm really looking forward to see it on her. For the knitting itself, I almost always knit with circular needles because I, I knit everywhere, also in public transportation or in waiting rooms. The needles does not bother the neighbor, the person next to me, nor does it ever fall down. And at home, I can knit on armchairs with armrests. I love creative ideas and nice decoration. I buy inspiring magazines and books. My daughter was always my biggest fan and my favorite model. My own projects are mostly from leftover yarn and from sample balls. The ear covers of my favorite armchair are crotcheted and knitted only from yarn remnants. I have a simple sewing machine that I mainly use for sewing curtains and things for the house. I love the striking pieces with special details like color, pockets and crystals. The construction is important for me. In the past, I have never talked about why I use this or that design or yarn. Just since I'm writing posts, I'd like to be more specific. And that is the direction I want to focus on. Celebrate handmade and do it yourself. Prefer ecological, sustainable and environmentally friendly products. Show the beauty and value of the often underestimated abilities, sewing on buttons, sewing the hem, wave in yarn ends, embellish. Even the big haute couture brands appreciate the handwork in their shows and share detailed photos on their internet pages. I'm grateful to all the great designers, creators, dyers, spinners who show their work in social media and share their skills, ideas and experience with us through groups, pictures, tutorials, videos and podcasts. I'm pleased to be part of this community. Uta Reina is a very crafty woman. Um, she 
as you saw, she crochets, knits, embroiders. She seems to be a real passionate hand crafter. Um, I have checked out, she's got a, a blog, which is in German. I had a look at it and had a bit of a read. She actually says on her blog, she's an honest woman. She says she likes showing off her work. <laughs> well, who <laughs> which, doesn't? <laughs> which I did also think of you. you like, I mean, she likes to have her work admired, which I think is a great thing. Absolutely. Um, when you put a lot of work into it, it's lovely to hear positive comments. Yep. Yep. Her blog yeah. is called Heute Strick Ich, which means today I'm knitting. Uh, yeah. So it is in German. We'll put the link to that in the show notes together with yeah. uh, other um, social media links that she's got. I'm not sure exactly whether she's on Instagram or what, but I think she is. And you could follow her, even if you can't follow the German on Instagram, the pictures are there. Yeah, I thought she was really um, yeah. she's, inspiring. I think she's quite – people knit for all different reasons, and I think I can really relate to Uta because she loves beautiful finishing and hawk and – ah. Haute couture. <laughs> Haute couture. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. So she, she loves the fine detail that makes a garment – really beautiful and I really admire that as well and she's got a lot of skill there I yeah. I would like some of that skill to rub off on me it's it certainly needs to rub off on me on the crochet department when I have more time I want to uh, improve those skills but it is she's done a lot of Marie Wallen uh, designs because you can add all of these skills together you can put the crochet on top of the knitting that makes it great and, and the embroidery that she did on the sleeves it's just mm -hmm. stunning. And she does, she uh, blogs a lot about the finishing techniques that she uses, which is great. So I'm definitely going to read some more of her blog and you can follow her. Yep. She's also very keen on the, the fashion side of it. Yes, which I am too. I love garments. Yep. I really love garments. Yep. So for our German speaking watchers, viewers, go and check it out. If you don't already. Yep. Yeah, because she's already very popular, I think. Yeah. Okay, so from the archives, I'm now going to talk about this garment, which I'm wearing. It is called Anne Boleyn, and it was designed by Alice Darmore, and it features in her Tudor Roses. And I knitted it at the end of 2013, beginning of 2014, and it was the first garment I knitted using Alice Darmore's yarn. It's knitted in the Hebridean two-ply, and I learned so much from knitting this design. Um, and I want to share that with you. The first thing I can say I really learned about it was to trust a top designer's instructions. If you get a designer who is very well respected and writes out a lot of detailed um, instructions, trust them, particularly Alice Darmore. In the Tudor Ro Roses book, I've knitted quite a few of those designs and I've never found one typo. There's been times when I've looked at it and thought, that has to be wrong, this, this must be written wrong, but it was always me that was wrong. So if, if you are doing one of her designs and you're reading her instructions, if you think it's wrong, it's probably not. <laughs> So just reread it and rethink about it. She is meticulous and that is really a joy. It is great to be able to trust what's written, especially when you're doing a new technique that you're not familiar with. But let me get back and tell you about this design. It's called Anne Boleyn. Anne Boleyn was King Henry VIII's second wife and she was a very modern woman. She came from a very politically active family. She was the cause, really, of uh, England breaking away from Rome and the Catholic Church and the, and the start of the Church of England. So this is because King Henry VIII divorced his first wife and in order to marry Anne Boleyn. And her family was very political and she was a rural reformist. So this design is actually knitted, and I'll put some pictures over here so you can see closer detail in the shape of a fitted jacket or shirt. So like a modern businesswoman, that was the inspiration for Alice. So because she perceives Anne as, be, as being really a woman ahead of her times. But you've got these very, these colorful vertical lines um, that are bobbled and they um, sort of hint back to the very highly ornate beaded costumes and uh, that um, Queen Anne would have worn and the cuffs you've got very uh, if the, the cuffs and there's a belt section a half belt at the back 
it's highly decorative and that's sort of like a um, embro embroidered borders that were often on the, the gowns. So it's a mixture of modern and ancient, which is beautiful. Also these vertical lines, there's, there's a twisted stitch cable on either side of it, which just help it sort of stand out a bit. And in between is reverse docking stitch. And all the shaping of the garment goes in this reverse docking stitch which makes it very, very elegant and gives it a very beautiful fitted look. So the first thing I can say uh, that I learned to do, I did my swatch and I can only encourage you to swatch. Just think of it as a square or two squares from a cozy, cozy memory blanket. That's all you're doing, the <laughs> squares of a cozy memory blanket. And then you can be guaranteed that your garment is going to be way more successful, I'd say 80% more successful if you hadn't swatched. Okay, there's just a little bit of encouragement. <laughs> okay, so I swatched and I had to go down a couple of needle sizes just to get the correct gauge and I was very nervous about this because the fabric seemed to be a lot stiffer than what I was used to knitting and I remember my mum always telling me you don't want a too stiff a fabric because that can help or lead to felting so I was really nervous what do I do in the long run I just decided to trust her and go with it I'm so glad I did because the structure of the fabric is so integral to the design it is going to be whether that it fits and how it hangs on your body and it is a slightly uh, uh, stiffer fabric but that actually means that it's not going to um, a stretch in an ugly way it's going to sit keep its shape for years it'll be beautiful so that's the first thing I learned this section here this little belt and what's on the cuffs was seriously the most difficult thing I'd ever done and probably still the most difficult thing I've ever done because it can it combines every single technique I think that I know of almost in one row <laughs> <laughs> So the first thing you're doing is knitted flat, okay, and in one row you will have your strandings. As you can see, there's different colours there. So you have, and if I turn it around on the back side, or it's easier if I show the cuff inside out, you can see that the colour, that the, um, there's floats being carried across. Um, okay, so you're, you're fair isling. But then you've got a combination of knit stitches and purl stitches. So when you're when you're you've got the work facing you, the right side, you have to remember you've got to bring your your um, wool around to the front to purl, then bring it around to the back so that the float is not going to be carried on the front side but always on the back side. So you're you're changing between a purl and a knit, and that just gives it again another texture. She's um, Alice is all about color and texture together which I totally love. So you've got purl and knitting in one while fair isling in one row and then of course you've got to do the same thing on the wrong side of the row which is difficult enough. On top of that you're cabling. As you can see these um, these light, this lighter brown color is being pulled in all the time. So you're cabling as long as as well as purling and knitting in the same row and then you are you've got intarsia because of these bobbly bits here you've got some bobble bits there but also on the cuff you can see it perhaps a little bit closer you've got uh, four little bobbles here and four little bobbles there in different colors so you've got other threads that you need so when you come to it then you've got to create your bobbles in the intarsia so you've got all of these things happening at once. It is really the moment of, you don't get any hours of boredom here, but you do get a few moments of terror. <laughs> yeah. Just relating back to this pilot I, I chatted to. So it's not for TV with subtitles. It's not, but it's only a small section and it, the effect is stunning. And you can really play around with these designs or with these techniques in a small area if you stuff it up you can do it again because you later sew it on so it's only a small section at the time I actually hadn't even heard of intarsia I didn't know intarsia existed if I had known I would have looked up intarsia and learned a little bit about it and it would have helped me because these bobbles along here are actually done in intarsia that means you have 
um, you knit across the row and when you come to this this section here you pick up your strand of this this color here you knit what you need to you drop it you continue on with your um, the dark green or background color and just work these colors as you come you're not going to strand them behind so that's intarsia but what happened for me and I can show you one of my swatches and how ugly it is I can remember this bit you can yes yeah. <laughs> so here and I still got a, a bit pin of frustration hanging in here. it the, if I show you this up and this is really the raw guts of my knitting so I'm, I'm do you want to hold this for yeah, me? Yeah. You can see how disgusting my bobbles are for a start. They're all odd and, and you know, I'm just playing around. But you learn a lot through a swatch because if you look at this, these are really neat. These are really neat now. And that's just through playing around a little bit on a swatch first. Alice Darmore always gives you extra yarn so that you've got enough to knit a swatch properly as well as your garment, which is fantastic. But what I was having a problem with was these bits were just falling out of my knitting all the time and I couldn't figure out why. That's because with intarsia, you're meant to loop the, the um, strands around each other to hold them in place. Yeah, so I was finding that my insides <laughs> were, Your falling insides out. were falling out. That sounds terrible. The so bobbly bits were kept falling out. So what I thought, what can I do? So in the end, I just stranded the background green color across here just once and I found that kept them in so if I go back to showing you here let's hold this up again yeah. you will see there's a tiny strand of green in between the bobbly bits and I personally it, it works the, gar the garment is beautiful and it works but it's not as beautiful as if that as it would be if that strand wouldn't be there because then you'd get a continue color the same color up with the bobbled texture and that would look even better than just here it just looks like separate bobbles so that's something that I learned on this which I thought was very interesting but it's a beautiful design and I highly recommend um, yeah trying it's, it you know, I think it's a really great design because it's on the one hand it's really extravagant you know it looks like clothing for royalty that's what yeah, I reckon yeah but at the same time you can actually wear it it's not like you walk out and feel like it's over the top it's yeah you know, I, I love to wear usable. it with what I'm wearing now which is a, just a very simple uh, tartan dress yeah it, it I think it's made to go with it yeah yeah it's yeah, absolutely beautiful yeah so, so it's time to announce the winners of our two cows as mascot of the first garment cowl, um, I get to make the announcement that the winner of this cowl is Grace from Sydney, or Grace is an Irish lassie who's been traveling the world and is now staying in Sydney. I'm not sure for how long. So Grace, congratulations. The prize for this cowl is, as we've said, the Knowledgeable Knitter by Margaret Radcliffe. Yes. yes. Um, this is a really good book. It's uh, really well written, it's easy to read, and it's going to help you so much with your continued garment knitting, which I know and I've seen that you've been doing. So the garment that Grace knitted was by Tin Can Knits, and it was flax, and here's a picture of it. Well done, Grace. She's yep. knitted a couple of garments since then, so she's on a roll. That's great, That's, and yeah. I'm really impressed. We had a, a very intimate group in the first garment cowl. It was four people um, completed. But um, I thought it was really impressive, the garments that people did. So congratulations for, to everyone who took part. And we've got a little bit more news on that at the end. But now we can jump to the Feral Cowl. Yes, the Feral Garment Cowl. And the winner for that is Margaret. So Margaret's Ravelry name is a little bit unpronounceable. It's Mar Margaret Stknkfult. <laughs> <laughs> which I think is a short for Margaret Stitching, Knitting and Quilting. Okay. And Margaret Knitted Cruden by Isolde, and here's a picture. Well done, Margaret. This is really exciting. She did a beautiful job. And the, the prize for the Fair Isle Garment Carl, £25, and that's pounds sterling, not pounds in weight, <laughs> of... Alice Darmore's yarn. So this was a, a, a gift that we were going to donate. So I phoned up, or not phoned up, I'm, I emailed Virtual Yarns, which is Alice Darmore's online yarn store, and asked how can I arrange to organize a gift certificate um, for 25 
pounds worth of, of yarn for the choice of the winner. And they said to me that they would match that and the winner can have 50 pounds worth of yarn. I thought, my God, <laughs> I wish I was the winner. <laughs> yeah. So well done, Margaret. All of a sudden, your prize has jumped from 25 pounds worth of Alistair Moore yarns to 50 pounds worth of Alistair Moore yarns. That's a great prize. Personal message me your address, same with Grace, um, so that we can follow up on that. So well done to both of you. We're so happy that you um, that everybody participated. It's, a, it's sort of a shame because so many people did such a great job. It's always a shame um, having one winner. You think everybody needs a prize. Yes. But basically but. you've got your prize, you've got your finished garment. And this, that which leads us on to the selfie video collage. Yes, that's so right. So we did extend the date for this so that if anybody didn't make the cutoff date for the finish, finished objects, you could still try to finish your project, do your 20-second selfie video, send it to us, and then we will make a collage out of it to celebrate your work. And the cutoff date for that is November the 20th because we need time to edit it. Yep, so 20th of November, get them in. We really enjoy that. I think a lot of viewers also said they really enjoyed seeing everyone. Yeah. I think it's fun um, yeah. and it's a good reward and a recognition for everyone who's managed to get their garments finished. Yeah. So now we're up to Marie Wallen, part two. It's really great to see how her designs um, come together and to see her drawings, to see her swatches. So goodbye from us. Enjoy the rest of it, and we'll see you in two weeks. And thank you so much for spending your time with us. Yep, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you in two weeks. So can you show us now a couple of garments that you've made along with the sketches and swatches so we could see the developmental process? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Right, um, this first garment here that I want to show you um, is one of my favourites. I wear it a lot and it's Lovage from uh, Windswept. So this is one that is knitted all in the round, um, as you can see. Um, and then it has a crochet trim put on, which is optional, which you can um, put on or not put on. Um, but I, I do add crochet trims to, to a lot of my garments because I just think it adds quite a really nice uniqueness to them. Um, but to show you um, the how this design developed, um, that this is the original. This is my original swatch, which is that there. So you can you can see that there. Um, so what I would have done, I don't think I've done any. Oh, I have done some Swiss darning on it. So there you go. I did this a while ago, so you'll have to bear with me. Um, so I actually um, Swiss darn some of this pink in there. On there so originally I had a different color and I didn't like it so um, so that's what I do so I, I knit this and then once I'm happy with it colors and everything then I actually then um, chart it out and then it, it's then sent to my pattern writer with a very detailed um, specification specification is is something really um, I give her detailed measurements for the photography garment, which is this garment here. Um, and that's a UK size um, 8 stroke 10 or size small. Um, and then from, from, from that, my, my pattern writer actually grades all the other sizes. So when I first started my business, I, did, I sat down and worked out the, the size grading that I wanted to use, sent that to my pattern writer, and, and I asked her to grade all my garments um, using these grading rules. Um, and then, so really, so all the information I send my pattern writer are, is everything. So it's the length, the width, the underarm, but it's it's really quite small details as well. So the length of the actual, the rib, um, how much fur I want there, um, the cuff, the actual cuff width, the actual welt width, the neck, back neck width. So virtually, Anything that can be measured, um, you know, I, I give to my, my pattern writer. Um, and then she gets, because she's actually based in Spain, she doesn't actually physically get the swatch. We, uh, I scan it to her. 
Um, but I give her the um, the tension based off based on this swatch, um, and um, she also gets the pattern chart and, and everything. And when I actually do a design that's knitted in the round, um, I also give her where I want it, where the decreases need to be, and everything. So, um, so it's it's all quite detailed what I actually send to her. Um, and it takes quite a while, you know, a good few hours to 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 get one design prepared to send to my pattern writer. That design in particular would be, I would assume, would be reasonably easy to grade through bigger sizes. Yes. But do you have, is there difficulty with some of your designs or do you have that in the back of your mind when you're designing? How is this going to look on a bigger shaped body or, a, you know, because the... Yes. the, the yeah, one of the one of the biggest problems I have, which is I find frustrating as from a because I'm a designer and um, that was really got a lot of experience in the commercial industry, um, is a problem that if you're producing books and obviously you've got a printed pattern in book, you're limited to the amount of space that you can put in in the actual book. Now there's certain designs that you would say, for example, on all sizes, you wanted 10 centimetres of the same farewell showing on the top of all the sleeves and all the sizes. Well, for in order for you to do that, and really by rights, you have to you have to write out a whole pattern for each of the actual sizes. Yeah. Um, which is which you can't do because you have physically haven't got the space to do it. It's fine if you just do digital downloads and things like that because obviously you're not limited to the amount of information you give on a pattern. Um, but if you actually do printed books and printed patterns like I do, um, you you are limited to what you can do there. So you, you, I do try and design things that um, are easier to grade. Um, crochet is very difficult to grade. You can ask my pattern writer that because she turns her hair out <laughs> at me. Um, yeah. she always, at the end of writing crochet patterns for me, she'll always say to me, I I'm never writing another one for you again. <laughs> um, there you go. Um, okay, great. So have you got another design you can show us? Absolutely, yes. I shall just put it on. So I'd like to show you this design. It's a plain, one of the plain designs that I do. Um, and this is Petal from um, Springtime. I've chosen this one because I do really like this one and I really like to, to wear it. And I know it's, it seems to be quite popular when I've done um, shows that over the over this coming year and I've worn it, worn it at workshops. It's, I get a lot of comments on it. Um, I think people really like um, this shaping um, area here um, with the garter stitch. And then they particularly like this broken um, stoling effect here. Um, but again, just to show you, that's my original design swatch there, which is in um, a different colour. Um, so I think that was maritime. This was in duck egg, uh, which is rowan felted tweed. So, uh, so I haven't really changed that at all. So stitches tend to be quite easier for me to do, really, as far as doing the swatches. I very rarely have, have to change them. Um, um, and then obviously from that, um, I think originally I did have the idea of doing this broken um, broken design here. Um, so and then the actual um, design came, you know, to fit the actual garment shape. So what I was saying earlier, where I, I tend to do the fabric and then the garment, there are a couple of um, exceptions. <laughs> yeah, a couple of exceptions where I do, which but, but they do tend to be the more plain ones that I, I do that. Um, so that's that. But I mean, to show you an, an example of the, I mean, that's the type of, of sketch that I do, um, which goes with the with the swatch and all the pattern information with my with my pattern writer so that actually um shows her that but i actually find these useful for when i actually come and do my um um styling for the shoot so um i put all these sketches of the of each of the designs within the collection um into my computer and onto a onto one sheet and then i write on um next to each one uh, what what clothes are going to be used to be styled with it so you know I, I do use them quite a bit really okay so so that's so that's that garment there um as far as construction goes it's it's all knitted flat it's knitted in pieces so it's all quite straightforward it's quite fitted it's um it's uh, set in sleeves um and really it all needs to be sewn together using mattress stitch so okay 
Um, so I want to show you this garment because this is from my latest book, Winter Crochet. Um, this is probably my favourite garment out of the whole collection. Um, I just love it, really. I love motifs, uh, really, because, again, I'm colour-driven and you can put really nice colours together within using motifs So because you've got all the different shapes as well. So you're not limited to colours that are, are just going across a, a row. Um, but I particularly like using knit and crochet together. I really feel that it makes garments a lot more wearable and a lot more fashionable. Um, crochet as a craft has got this um, has, has got this name for being quite um, frumpy and unfashionable and, and stuff. And it's a really lovely craft and it's a really lovely skill to be able to do. Um, so that's why I deliberately sort of like use both knit and crochet together because sometimes when you, you do a whole crochet garment it can be quite fussy so if you can imagine that that whole of that front done as a whole garment i think that probably would be slightly too much um, yeah. so um so i've just done it on the front um, it is actually um just got a border on the back and it's got the same border for the sleeves and um, so what you do here um you um for the front you actually do the whole of, of the, the motif front first then you do this section here afterwards and then the the ribs knitted downwards from that and then it's the same on 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 the back so you do this first and um, then you do this border edge here knit knit the actual rib downwards knit that um crochet that border across the motifs there and then you knit upwards in stock and stitch for the back and the sleeves are done in the same way. So that's quite a nice garment to do because it's, you know, incorporates a knit and crochet. The knit, set, knit parts of it are very simple because they're just in stock and stitch. Um, and then it's just used to, it's getting used to actually picking up stitches from um, um, a crochet edging really, but it's, it's the same principle as picking up stitches from knitting. So yeah. you're just literally picking up uh, and knitting a stitch from a crochet stitch. So it's, it is quite easy to do. In some cases actually, um, it's easier to see a crochet, the stitches on a crochet edge than it is on a, on a knitted edge. So, so that, and then that's my original design swatch which is practically the same on there so um yeah that's so, really beautiful and yeah. you do use a lot in your early collections as well just little bits of crochet as ornamentation on plain yes. knitting yes yes I, I, I do that and I particularly like using crochet trims on top of feral garments as well so I quite often put a crochet trim down down the front um, of a button band or across the shoulders across the top of the sleeves and then down down the um, elbow arm as I mentioned before it's it's just something I like to do and I just think it makes things look a little bit more unique but they're there you know it's not integral to the garment so they'd always add it afterwards so it's your choice if you add them or not really so yeah yeah great right I wanted to show this garment sage which is also from my first book uh Winslet, which is probably one of the most popular garments I've designed to be honest um, a lot of people seem to be knitting it and it inspired the sage throw. Um, that came into being because the Campaign for Wool, which is an initiative that the British Wool Marketing Board start, uh, started with Woolmark um, to promote wool, um, they actually saw it a few years ago and really liked it and they commissioned me to do an actual throw in the, in the same design, um, hence the sage throw. And then the sage throw then inspired my Farrell Club um, the first fur our club blank blanket because the sage throw itself is just one big throw made out of the one pattern and a lot of people loved it and a lot of people wanted to knit it but were quite daunted by the actual size of it and so I thought well how can I actually um, do something to make the knitting of it easy so I thought well why not split it up into into different sections and you know the blanket will just grow and then before they know it they've they've got a whole blanket done so for our club was born out of that and the first one was um it's just finished actually um it's it was a blanket made up of 12 different fair hour squares um which were all sewn together and some people have actually steeped the squares uh, which is quite interesting um 
and then sewing them together. So I wanted to carry on with a, with a second sort of blanket and um, the Farewell Club 2 actually um, starts on the 1st of November. This one's slightly different, I can't really show you the whole thing here, but, um, but it's slightly different from the fact that it's not worked in squares, it's worked in um, the first section is an actual square, the second section is an oblong which is attached to the square by just sewing and that's the only sewing within the whole blanket and then the rest is actually worked off each other so it's like it's built up like a log cabin and there's a different um, fur owl pattern within. The, there's not as many colours used um, as in the first fur owl club one, I think I virtually used every colour on the um, Rowan Felsby Tweed colour palette for that one, but this one um, has has a lot less colours in it, and it's more more green and sort of rusty red sort of um, colourway, which I think makes it a bit more ideal for an in interior piece, really. So, are you able to share with us what collections you're working on for next year? Um, well, I'm just about to start working on um, a collection using Jameson's of Shetland yarn, um, which I'm really excited about. A, a massive big box arrived um, on Wednesday at the house and, um, and it was just full of all these colours of Spindrift, which are just look amazing. Um, so, um, so I'm going to design a collection um, of fur owls with, with their yarn and it's going to be called Shetland. I'm hoping to photograph it up in Shetland in April. How um, exciting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm really, really excited about that one. Um, and then I'm doing another book using Rowan yarn, um, which is um, called Gansey, or I don't know if that's actually going to be the final title of it. But it's it's about my take on on the traditional Gansey. So um, there will be stitch work, um, but there will be some pattern and, and colour work in there. But it's going to be a pre predominantly blue collection. So yeah, so but it'd be using blues from different different yarns within the Rowan range rather than one particular yarn, which is just blue. Both of those collections sound fantastic, and I certainly would be. I'm looking forward to that. Okay. I haven't used the, the Jamison yarns yet and, and having those yarns combined with your design sounds like paradise for me. So yeah, yeah. I'm super excited. Yeah, yeah. I'm all, I'll also be doing a, a small collection using um, other small producers' yarns as well. So alongside that, so as I'm hoping to photograph everything all together in April. So um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's all really good and exciting stuff. Just a final question, and that is, you've worked as the head designer of Rowan for 10 years and you continue to bring out stunning self-published knitting collections. So you've really had a very influential position in the hand knitting industry. Where do you see the hand knitting industry heading and what would be your vision for it? Well, the hand knitting industry has changed a lot, I think, over the last sort of like 10, 12 years since I, I joined Rowan, really. Um, it's changed a lot because there's a lot more small producers out there um, offering some really quite beautiful yarns, um, you know, ranging from hand spun stuff all the way through yeah, and, and hand dyed things. Um, and there's a lot more, especially in the UK, a lot more yarn producers producing yarns that are using British wool, which um, I'm really a big supporter of. Um, so from that point of view, I think it's great that you, you've got these small producers and, there's, and the, the bigger brands have to compete against them. It keeps them on their toes, hopefully. Um, so I think that's um, that part of the market is only going to go from strength to strength. Quite a few independent designers now also do their own own yarn range as well. So um, you might have to watch this space with what if I'm going to ever produce a yarn. So, um, so yeah. So you know. So I, I think it's 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 that it's the sort of the smaller end of the the, the yarn you know, the yarn producer side, I see, you know, growing even more and the dominance of the bigger brands being less and less. Well, look, it has been so wonderful to talk to you today. I'm so grateful that you've given us the time. And I think the viewers are also very grateful that you've given so much of your knowledge about Fair Isle and colour combining and all of that. So that's been, that's really something that we can work with. Um, I really look forward to your new books coming out. And thank you again for your time and being on the Fruity Knitting Podcast. And thank you. Thanks for asking me. It's been great fun.